traditionally affordable housing has been in, um, inside these neighborhoods and, and even though it's very difficult still to afford, there are many examples of that pattern providing affordable housing and jobs uh, in a way that this uh, freeway oriented pattern cannot. Provided diversity of housing types then is the ancillary to this provide good jobs close to homes. And similarly, this same pattern prevails. And this photograph of Vancouver gives a really good idea of what the dominant, uh, very low rise fabric of this community is. The tourist posters always show the downtown towers, but we know that this city is largely a low rise city and this is the consequence of its evolution around the streetcar, basically between 1890 and 1940. And it's characterized by these kinds of houses that you see. And these kinds of houses in this picture are demonstrations of the ways that these original buildings are now being adapted, uh, not just for additional density, but for very different family sizes and types. The average family in Vancouver in 1920 and 1930 uh, used to be six people. It's now down to less than two people in the average family. So the housing is adapted. Uh, originally a single family home is now a three family home with this brand new 15 foot wide insertion here. Or this original one family bungalow is now three dwelling units, two in the principal residence and one in the lane house behind. That's inside the fabric of the community of perhaps even greater importance is what's happening along the arterials with this example from uh, the corner of Collingwood and 4th Avenue if anyone uh, is familiar with it. Four story uh, mixed use buildings with residential on the top, uh, apartment buildings, townhouse units in the back, a terrace up on top of the store which provides open space for uh, the residents on the uh, upper level. By the way, this density here as illustrated here comes pretty close to the density that you can achieve with a high rise. I like to think of this particular model as a high rise tipped on its side. Uh, to make the argument that density doesn't necessitate a high rise, it's just that for whatever sets of reasons, and I think Richard will talk to these a little bit more specifically, uh, the market, uh, the political forces that be, whoever think that the high rise is the way to go. The sixth one created a linked system of parks. And the seventh, lighter, greener, cheaper, smarter infrastructure. I'm not going to speak to these, but I want to also to emphasize the point that environmental issues around uh, protecting our aquatic systems in particular are important as well. So that's like just the opening salvo. Uh, we're coming down now to show you a few images from some work that was done uh, with me and some of my students a couple years ago, one of whom is in the crowd here, Nadia, it's good to see you, uh, one of our students. And we, they were asked to do a, a look at the city of Vancouver and uh, think about the wild possibility that the city might actually double in population over the course of the next uh, 40 years, out to 2040 and 2060. What would that look like and would it be recognizable and would it be a place that we'd want to live and would it be indeed sustainable or green in the ways that we're all interested in? So we assumed a doubling of population for uh, somewhat academic reasons but based on the presumption that uh, enhancing the density in the city of Vancouver may reduce the pressure to sprawl elsewhere, but we wanted to see what that would do. We had some science that suggested it was not impossible to uh, achieve a reduction in per capita greenhouse gas by 80%. And a big part of that was to achieve an 80, uh, a target of 80% of all trips in the city by biking, walking, and transit. Wow. We're at about 45% now, so it's not <coughs> impossible. The city's 40%. Uh, the city's uh, medium term target is uh, to get that to 50%. Places like Copenhagen are <coughs> already at that level, so it's not impossible. But we don't know what that would look like. And oh, by the way, make sure that we can afford to live in all these new housing units. <coughs> uh, that work's been featured in many places, including the TIE, so there's more details available just by Googling. Uh, to that work. 
The work was very extensive. It's amazing what you can do when you have 25 students who are working 40 hours a week for no pay. Uh, you can get a lot done in a term. So there's a lot of detail, but it comes down to this. This was a, a map that in its original size was way bigger than this wall. It was at least as wide as the wall and twice as tall as the ceiling because these were uh, one meter square maps that people were working on. <coughs> so every house necessary to uh, provide that additional, it turns out to be a couple hundred thousand dwelling units is shown there as well as the job space are required to keep those good people occupied. So zooming in a little bit, the north, uh, the northeast quadrant of the city, anywhere you see a uh, brightly colored area is an area that uh, the students suggested would be a, a good candidate for additional density. And you can start to see the pattern emerge where the arterials close to transit, uh, uh, typically on top of one-story commercial buildings that exist there now. Uh, became the logical place to put that additional density. And coming in yet even further, you can see the great attention to detail that the students applied to make sure that they knew where each and every one of those dwelling units might arrive. If you happen to live in one of these parcels, my apologies, this is, this is we're looking at a 2050, so the bulldozers are not going to show up tomorrow. But the most, what that really results in, uh, that's a lot of detail and a lot of individual things. What's important, I think, for this conversation is what that means in terms of the fundamental pattern that emerges. So this first pattern is what emerged in terms of the intensification of existing landscapes around corridors and nodes, places that we're all uh, quite familiar with. For example, you see a commercial right there where, uh, where we are right now. And that suggests, and, and the students came up, oh, this is painful that this uh, projector is so whitewashing here, all these beautiful drawings. But this is a beautiful drawing showing a prototypical possibility, less than four stories in this case, uh, that included uh, live work, uh, commercial uh, workshop space, as well as a uh, substantial number of new housing types that integrated back into the existing neighborhood. Uh, job space, of course, is necessary. You need space for that um, additional uh, 200,000 jobs in the community if you're imagining a doubling. And without getting into great detail, this is an example from False Creek, False Creek Flats. The green systems are preserved and this place is knitted into the community rather than separated away from it. What we thought was almost the most important part of it was this concept of the green grid so that certain streets within the city, if you reduced the use of the automobile by 50 to 80 percent, that means that the pressure on streets would be consequently reduced, opens up the possibility to use our streets in different ways, where streets would become greened and opportunities for green, for, green, uh, for gardening, for uh, outdoor play, for uh, ecological habitat, and a whole number of things, uh, bikeways, of course, and a whole number of things that they're presently not capable of uh, supplying citizens. And uh, all within the larger framework of uh, preserving, protecting, and extending the existing system of uh, large parts, parks and ecological locations. Building new housing can actually be a way to restore the existing, uh, the, the stream system that did once exist. This is a salmon stream that uh, did exist, which in the context of adding additional density or new housing could be restored and revived so our stream system comes back after having been buried for so long. So at the end of the day, all those patterns go together and that's what the students suggested was the pattern for a city of uh, 1.4 million people. What's interesting about this is that uh, that, that, that uh, fairly substantial increase in the population of the city was achieved without high rises. To be perfectly fair, there was a couple suggested, uh, one at 41st and uh, Canby, and uh, another one where there are some existing high rises there. And it wasn't a prohibition in the class 
but generally the students felt that those the density targets which uh, their their faculty me supplied could be met without the ne the necessity of high rise. Um, that pattern, however, uh, does necessitate thinking about transportation and how are you going to move around this original streetcar city, add that density to that original streetcar city, uh, and respect the existing framework of the city as we find it, particularly outside doors such as these. Uh, and it raised the question of, well, really, how are we spending our transportation dollars now? So this is why this intersects with a question that's not really on the table today, but I actually think it is on the table. The, uh, the uh, Broadway subway is being touted as the transportation answer for our city, and in the same breath, they're saying it requires incredible additional density in order for it to make sense. So at the expenditure of $3 billion on the subway also calls upon the city, and it's been expressed this way, to rationalize, to make that logical by adding a whole lot of density along the Broadway corridor, i.e. high rises, 100,000 new uh, uh, residential uh, uh, residents and jobs, as has been expressed in the KPMG report. So this is what $3 billion will buy you in uh, subterranean subway. And this is what the same $3 billion will buy you if you use surface light rail using the same kind of uh, technology that some of us were familiar with from the Olympics in 2010. That's a picture of the Olympic line Bombardier uh, system. So for the same three billion dollars you could basically restore what was the original uh, streetcar system in the city of Vancouver with modern trams giving people the option of uh, easy and greenhouse gas zero transportation throughout the city to correlate with this vision of an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases. Uh, more than um, almost half of our greenhouse gas production in this city is a consequence of driving our cars. So that's a crucial thing to change. Uh, <clears throat> just to give you the sense that this isn't a, just a one-off, uh, then four concluding slides with some other work that we've done over the years. This one was uh, uh, 2011 project, City of North Vancouver hired me and our <coughs> research group, this was not a student project, but a research group project, to look at a 100-year plan for the City of North Vancouver with a zero greenhouse gas uh, target. And uh, that one there, here again, uh, it seemed to us, based on the sustainability goals, that this city actually had the capacity to grow quite a bit. This was, believe it or not, hold your breath, a tripling of the population of the city of North Vancouver, yet it was over 100 years, and the target was a 100% reduction in greenhouse gases. And I believe that at the end of the day, the place is quite recognizable, uh, and so did the constituents who reviewed this. The point of this exercise, though, um, a major point of this exercise was to see and. Oh, this is really sad that this is so washed out. But anyway, imagine, if you will, the city of North Vancouver. And this is its performance now in terms of greenhouse gas generation. <coughs> the greener it is, the better you're doing. So if you live in those green blocks, you're cool. And that's because your buildings are such that generally, on average, they're performing better. And also, you're using your car less, and you're walking more in those areas. After the change to the plan, we ran the same computer program, and lo and behold, the whole city uh, starts to capture that same uh, virtuous cycle dynamic. Then most recently, our work in the city of Surrey to look at the existing neighborhoods in a suburban landscape, uh, this one around Bear Creek Park, and focusing largely on King George Highway heading south to Newton Town Center. Uh, doubling of that population from 75,000 to 150,000 and a very sparing or almost non-use of high rises to achieve that density. More important yet again was to capitalize on the existing transportation arterials which like Vancouver actually organized themselves around the same half mile grid fortuitously and use those as opportunities for creating new neighborhood centers and 
what I think most importantly, the gradual infill or changing of the existing housing along these arterials to more complex uses for the varied family types that we have now. And I'm sorry, boy, are they varied. Uh, not only are they small, they're extended with multi-generations uh, living in the same building and also allow opportunities for business enterprises to occur along these arterials which now are exclusively housing and makes it impossible for you to get a liter of milk without um, uh, expending a liter of gasoline in order to acquire that liter of milk. All this taken together leads uh, us to the ability to again remodel this with some fairly dependable uh, computer software and showing a 38% reduction in the amount of car use just from these changes in density and an overall 57% reduction uh, by 2050 in the per capita generation of greenhouse gases. That's not the most significant thing about this. I, I do believe that adding so much affordable housing and new job opportunities and restoring the green infrastructure of that region is equal to or perhaps even more important. I believe that's my last slide. If not, it should be. Yes. So that's it from me. Uh, I'm not sure. I think we just go directly to Richard, if, if that's the will of the group. Um, yeah. So before we go to Richard, let's say, are there any questions while the presentation is still fresh? Yeah, I've got a question. Uh, what, what is the most significant factor that makes a, a, a tower so equivalent, to a tower on its side, equivalent to a tower standing in, in the sky? Well, I, I, I fudge a little bit. I mean, typically you'll get somewhat greater density, uh, but not double <coughs> density out of a tower. Uh, I think we should discuss that further, but I think the tower is uh, driven not so much by its pure efficiency in terms of providing housing, but the market seems to be, uh, I can't, um, um, I want to be careful with words. The, the market seems to be focused on it at the moment, and the market doesn't seem uh, therefore able to absorb or speculate or provide other kinds of housing types. Um, I also think there's a political dimension to this, but I think we should leave that to the conversation later. Any more questions? Is there a place in the city for uh, towers in the, in the core that you sort of referred to and then uh, uh, not tower version and, and both parties kind of go at it and see what happens? Um, I personally, I mean, this, this work, you know, found a couple places that probably are logical for towers. Uh, for example, Cambian 41st uh, seemed logical to us for towers. Uh, Camby and, um, um, I, I forget the cross street, but somewhere around uh, 60th where there already are towers seemed like another location where the proposed new station was. But what was interesting and um, uh, important about the exploration is that we found no problem at all doubling the density of the city of Vancouver with just you know basically no towers. So, so it, it undercuts the argument that we need towers to get the density. Uh, but the, the, the conversation about the Broadway corridor, I think, is really crucial to this. Because if you're going to spend $3 billion on a transit system, then the argument is you need to have towers in order to justify that expenditure, to provide the ridership, to provide the tax income, the amenity fees, which are being speculated about they may be used to pay for the, the city's share of the system and so forth. So the tie-in between the towers question and the transit question, I think, is intimate, and not too many people are really recognizing that. That's what, that's what I'm frightened by. So I think we have time for one more question that we go to the, the woman back there then. Patrick, um, I forget the name of the system in Portland, right? The streetcar system there. So how did that city Uh, over the dead body of the Regional Transit Authority, actually, quite interestingly, the Regional Transit Authority down there was not keen at all to use the new technology. Uh, but it was the city, rather than a Regional Transit Authority, which out of desperation paid for it themselves and set up basically their own transit authority. It's now been included. Uh, they felt that that was necessary in order to um, help them uh, 
well, create the complete community that they wanted so that the streetcar system was part and parcel of their plans for the, uh, per the so-called Pearl District development, which is a mid-rise development. It's actually quite nice. So that's how that came about. Now they're expanding that system from that original uh, development back in the 90s so that uh, they will uh, probably this month complete the center city loop. And then they have long-term plans to actually restore the original streetcar system for the city of Portland. So their plans for the next phase of development are exactly to restore the streetcar system that they had in 19. 25. Yeah, one more, I guess. Okay. I'll make it quick. Yeah, really quick. Um, laneway homes, do you think as they're being implemented right now, it's a step in the right direction? Is there an ecological argument for them? Sorry, my hearing's bad. Laneway homes, yes. do you think as they're being implemented right now, are they a step in the right direction? I do. Okay. I do. And in fact, yeah, I think we should talk about that more later, but the short the story, story is, it, I think it really has to do with the shrinking family size and we really need to find ways that these parcels that used to have six people living on them can in one family can be repurposed for three families in the same parcel that just simply maintains the existing population so you have to really subdivide these homes to correlate with this new family size okay so next up is richard and um he wants to uh, my friend richard wants uh, to note that well, he was looking over the urban sprawl and just stretched onward, and he was saying, my job is done. Is that about right? Yes, it is. He's the guy. 